ljude po cijelom svijetu ma bud čule pro zamah na žetja političnoho oponenta režimu Putinja v Rusiji Oleksija Navalnoho. Cjoho težnja po holovnišeh mistah Rusiji vidbule se česleni proteste na pitremku cjoho vidomoho političnoho dijača. Sjohodnji pokažemo panelnu prezentaciju organizacije Atlantic Council, jaka čitko razkladaje jak činovnike režimu Putina starali se i ne zmogli vekonati ce za planovane vbivstvo Oleksija Navajnoho. Good morning, good afternoon and good evening. My name is John Herbst. I run the Eurasia Center at the Atlantic Council. We have an excellent Zoom event for you today um, regarding the peculiar happenings in Russia, the poisoning of Alexei Navalny. Конечно, операция такого масштаба и такой длительности не может быть организована никем, кроме как главой ФСБ Бортниковым, а он никогда бы не осмелился сделать это без приказа Путина. We found sufficient proof in my opinion for any court to decide to conclude that these were the people who poisoned Navalny, barring any very plausible alternative innocent explanation and alibi, which so far we have yet to hear even an inkling of. But more importantly for me, we found the existence of a long-running government structure based on two locations in Moscow and outside Moscow, whose only job it appears to be is to uh, poison people. First of all, I have to say, uh, this is really sort of nothing new. Russia has long been murdering its citizens. And I used to call it in the old days, obviously liquidating enemies of the people. In World War II, you know, they were more interested in running down and and killing Trotsky than they were finding out what Hitler's intentions were. And then even in the 1950s, I would, I would suggest people was an excellent book called The Man with the Poison Gun <clears throat> about um, Soviet and KGB efforts to kill Stepan Bandera, who was a Ukrainian nationalist. And they did kill him with a KGB created poison gun in Munich. But for years, people thought it was just a, a heart attack until this KGB officer defected. Um, and if, essentially, if you read the book about Bandera, you know, if you just change the names of Skripal and walk through what the KGB was doing in the 1950s, it's almost no different than what happened in, in the 2000s. And so the real question to me is, you know, why is why is this kind of activity continuing today in modern Russia? It, um, you know, why are they continuing with these sort of Soviet tactics? And the obvious answer seems to be is you have a KGB president who has a Czechist mentality. Uh, if you want to, Hill just wrote an article calling it sort of alpha, alpha male mentality. Um, because essentially these people, Navalny included, really, in, the, in a lot of the other journalists and others have been killed, aren't really a threat to Putin. So, I, you know, the notion that, you know, he thinks that he has to kill anyone who embarrasses him or might be even a slight enemy of the people, if you will, is crazy. And, and they're weaponizing their security services for all sorts of things. We saw in the 2016 election here in the United States, even using their security services to dope Paralympic and Olympic athletes. We saw recently directed energy weapons being used against American diplomats. And so I just want to point out that this, you know, you can look back at Soviet times to get as much data and, and information about what's happening now is, is what, what Bellingcat has pu is pulled forward, which is impressive. On the issue of tradecraft, um, clearly this is an embarrassment to Putin. You know, we talk, we joke a lot about implausible deniability you know, on MH17. You know, they come up with all these crazy reasons why, why things happened. But what Bellingcat's done here is put together such a strong case that you know there, there's almost nothing that, that Putin can say. And the fact that they, this recent thing came up after um, Putin's press conference and after Czechist Day is especially an embarrassment to Putin, I think. And you know, someone who takes great pride in being a Czechist and a KGB officer and, and using his intelligence services, this has to be quite a blow. Why do you think the Kremlin went to such extremes to get Navalny and is that, what does that say about Putin and his, his system? It seems by any objective measure, uh, the Kremlin, uh, and perhaps Putin personally, misjudged the threat and exaggerated the threat. And I think that's a function uh, perhaps of the nature and, and background of, of Putin's experience and the experience of those around him, the so-called Siloviki, who come from the security services and are, um, have a, a, a paranoid and conspiratorial worldview sort of baked into their politics and the way that they um, govern, but I think it's also at the same time a function of a kind of uh, degradation uh, of the uh, of the regime, uh, a sign of its age. Um, Putin, of course, is in power now for uh, 20 uh, plus years, and we've seen in recent years that system become less nimble, uh, less clever, 
uh, less capable at pulling off the kind of um, soft uh, or at least relatively softer forms of manipulation and control that it uh, was able to deploy quite skillfully in the 2000s and 2010s in, in terms of creating a very manicured and managed uh, politics uh, that um, uh, the Kremlin and other political technologists, or Putin and other political technologists, as they're called, um, appeared to have uh, some real skill in, in, in understanding how to uh, manage and keep uh, things placid. Uh, the system seems to be running out of new ideas and, and running out of new methods for how to keep up uh, with a changing society, a changing Russia. Uh, one of the main changes is the rise of the internet and the rise of YouTube, which Navalny has used uh, to such great uh, success. And, and here I think it's worth pointing out that Navalny is, is most dangerous to the extent he does present a, a kind of clear and present danger, real threat to the Kremlin. It's not as a politician who will uh, challenge Putin or others at the ballot box. It's essentially as uh, the country's premier investigative journalist uh, whose reports on corruption and YouTube uh, gain tens of millions of views. Uh, I, I believe it's still the most uh, popular or most watched investigation of his into corruption uh, allegations around uh, Dmitry Medvedev, uh, then uh, Prime Minister, ha has now about 30 million views. I haven't checked recently, but but recently it was up to 30 million. Uh, just already in, in a matter of days, the recording of the call that Navalny made to the FSB officer that we've been discussing has over uh, 10 million views. And, and those are the kinds of numbers that uh, at this point dwarf anything that's being shown in prime time on state television. So we're seeing a real kind of crossing uh, in the night as, as the traditional means of information uh, control and information dissemination, things like state television that the Kremlin took over very early in Putin's uh, rule, uh, those instruments are losing their efficacy and the new instruments that are arising, things like YouTube, the Kremlin doesn't uh, yet know uh, how best to control, doesn't so far um, kind of mustering um, the decisiveness to block uh, YouTube or engage in other kind of harsh Chinese style uh, censoring measures uh, on the internet. What do you make of this phone call between Navalny and Kudyatovsev? And why would Kudyatovsev uh, respond to Navalny's questions with such candor? And, and several of the FSB folks that Navalny called obviously hung up on him. And, uh, you know, this one, he, frankly, he, he bought the, he bought the story and, you know, when, when you're a bureaucrat way down in the in the system and, and someone above you supposedly is calling you, you yeah, he made a terrible mistake and he's gonna he's probably gonna pay for it. But there's a couple of things that I take from the phone call itself. Um because it, it confirms several things that a lot of people have been speculating on for the last you know, since since the attempt to assassinate uh Navalny. Uh and one of them was the intent was to kill. You know, people have talked about, well, maybe this was just a scare, maybe to get him to leave the country. You know, the intent clearly was to kill him. Uh, also, the intent was to hide their hands. You know, the fact that they put it on underwear, the fact that they they gave it to him in a place where there was no ability to photograph, you know, giving him tea or something in a restaurant, that type of thing. You know, the, the intent was to kill him. The intent was to hide this. It wasn't meant to send a signal to everybody, make it clear what, what's going on here. And the other thing we got to you really have to focus on is, it's clear, and Navalny said it best, that Putin was behind this. This was a long time, seriously run by the by the special services in Russia, sophisticated attack against a citizen. This is not something that some rogue unit ran or somebody just paid for off the thing. This went on for a long time. Um, this is something that Putin was clear, clearly behind. I think what we are disregarding here is the fact that, that Putin has built his image and reputation within Russia and within especially with his within his fast electorate within his firm electorate as uh, the Silovic guy the guy who actually may not be great about international diplomacy may not be great about raising the standards he'll not be great about econ economics and finance but he certainly is one of the best uh, Silovic in the world and he has he's running this machine that is hacking America um, well keeping dissent in the country and there control and so on and so forth. So he's excellent in running the FSB is a key cornerstone of his reputation within his core electorate. And now as a follow up to a, 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 an earlier blunder, uh, the Skripal uh, uh, 
mistake that uh, that ended up in the jury officers being paraded on television and doing this implausible story of them being tourists. This is probably a hundred times worse than that. And what I see in the last 24 hours, especially since the publication of the phone call, is Russia is taking FSB uh, as a joke, including the previous electorate of uh, the core electorate of, of Putin, uh, the ones who are not sold on the idea that this is a fakery because it's very difficult for something that was shot on four cameras and is essentially available from scratch to uh, to bottom uh, to, for anybody to listen to and make their own decisions. But the ones who are accepting that it's not a forgery actually are immediately jumping to the conclusion that the FSB is actually a, a facade. It's 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 a crumbling facade. It's a it's a joke. And all the memes in the Russian uh, uh, blogosphere, I mean, they're all making fun of the Kremlin. And one of the top-notch memes since yesterday is, uh, uh, I don't know who Navalny is, but I do know that, um, that uh, well, the Putin is washing his laundry. Um, so I don't think this is going to be priceless, or will a price will not be paid by the Kremlin for this. Well, then finally, we'll come back to what now should the West, the United States, and, and Europe do in regard to all of this information? And John, I'll give that question to you. Wow. So this is a much bigger question. The United States hasn't really pushed back against Russia over the last decade or more. We've continued to try to work with Putin. I think that the last couple of years has shown that, you know, trying to work with Putin as a partner is, is a fool's errand. And it's going to be interesting to see what the Biden administration does in terms of either pushing back or, you know, finding a few areas that work with them, but, but um, you know, push back in other areas. And so I do think, despite all this, uh, Putin wants to be taken seriously. He wants respect and relevance in the world. Um, but his actions are such that, you know, we need to push back and maybe treat him and, and the, the modern Kremlin as sort of as a pariah and push back. The notion that they should get full access to, you know, international meetings and that they're, they should get full access to Western banking and lawyer services and, and travel and things is something I think that the, the West needs to look at. Essentially, if, if the same burglar you know, aside from just this Navalny thing, all of the other things that have happened in the last few years, the same burglar keeps breaking into your house and, and trying to set fire to it, you know, just trying to, to, you know, get a bigger lock is a mistake. You need to go after that burglar. And so I think it's going to be really interesting to see how the United States responds to these cyber attacks, to the disinformation active measures campaigns, to the murders around the world, to undercutting our allies. All of these things are something that the, the next administration is going to have to take quite seriously. 